Welcome to The Edges of Lean. I'm Bella Engelbach, and in this podcast, we explore the human and creative side of lean thinking, unusual places where lean thinking is practiced. We meet people who are practicing continuous improvement in many different flavors and styles. So come along with me on a journey to the edges of lean. Episode 26, Continuous Improvement and Getting Your Book Written in Less Than a Year. My guest today is Don Brightman, the host of the Going North podcast, author, and self-leadership coach. Dom is all about books. His first job at the age of 16 was in a library. He loves reading books and learning from them and moved to writing his own books. He loves to share the voices of authors on his podcast. Today, he's sharing inspiring tips on how to get that book you've been wanting to write out of your head and out into the world. Don Brightman, welcome to the Edges of Lean. Woohoo! Thank you, Bella. Feels good to be on the edge of lean. That's right. Don't want to be on the edge of fat, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what, it is funny because when I tell people who are outside the continuous improvement lean community the name of my company, they want to know what the diet is. And I'm not offering any <laughs> diets at all. No diets here. <laughs> we're all we're all about we're all about enjoying ourselves and and um, you know. You could you can use continuous improvement to improve your diet, but I'm not recommending anything in particular. So, Dom, it's so cool to have you here, especially because you're one of my awesome guests who is not from the lean community. And that means that you have stuff to share with us that we might not have been thinking about in, in our little our little world. Um, so tell us about Dom. Um, who are you and um, how did you get to having a podcast and being a, being a coach and um, really promoting this idea of getting books written and talk people talking about their books? Uh, sure thing, Bella. Well, thanks a bunch for having me on your wonderful show, The Edge of Lean. That's right. All the Adam Copeland's, all the diets, even though there's no diet recommendations for this hour or this podcast it's a whole another podcast and as for yours truly aka the punisher the colonel of the corny joke kingdom graduate with the masters of dad jokes from pun state university <laughs> <laughs> mr dom brightman himself don't worry that's not that's not real at least not the pun state but anyways for for me though i love books i love people and grew up working in a public library when i turned 16 i could legally work and through those years of being an introvert, working with the public, helping out the community, helped me to grow and transform in the process to eventually find books of my own, eventually, especially leadership books by John Maxwell was probably one of my biggest influences ever to really discover self-improvement as a whole, because it's not just good to develop your professional self, but also yourself as a whole, because who is the person behind the darn title when that nine to five is over or when that eight to six is over and you have to develop the whole person so that's really what i'm all about starting in the library when i was in my teenage years going to college funny enough got an it degree from a community college thought i was going to be a computer fixing preacher but <laughs> life had other plans because the classic quote from mike tyson everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face and life yeah. will punch you in the face it'll hit you in the gut too and it'll keep you feeling quote unquote lean just to play more on the bad joke about what lean isn't <laughs> in this community yeah. and the fact that it's really all about advancing others to advance myself in the process because really that's one of the biggest tools if you want to advance a lot faster in life pick up books written by folks who may be dead or alive that have solve the problem especially the one that you want to solve learn from them and then they can be one of your mentors because books have helped me to advance further than ever before and through the power of books and listening to books and eventually becoming a writer of myself writing books of my own that's really kind of how i got to where i am today and still going because the story ain't over yet i love that i love this vision of you studying out in the library working in the library at age 16 i'm betting you were in the library before you were 16 they just weren't paying you right <laughs> you could say that <laughs> i didn't have unpaid staff status don't worry <laughs> <laughs> so books books are 
you know, there are a lot of books that get published, right? Um, but one of the things that I that I hear over and over again, and I actually even hear this from clients because I recommend books to people. Um, I, you know, I, I recommend my own book. I recommend other people's books. And I get some people like you, their eyes light up. It's like, oh, my goodness. Yes, I'd love to read that book. I love to read. And then there are other people. They just don't. They don't. People are not don't seem to read as much anymore. Are you seeing that? Um when you talk to people? Some people, yes. And they usually follow up with, I usually listen to podcasts and audiobooks. And I'm like, hey, that's freaking good. Because at least you're absorbing some kind of content that'll actually make you better. Because the thing is, heck, even myself, I love books. I love opening a nice physical hardback paperback covered book and reading it but the problem is like even though books are great they're slower than an audio program or a youtube video and last year during the pandemic yeah, heck even with my growing up i set a goal for myself to read 50 plus books a year after turning 21 last year i got to like 39 books because my constant absorption time went from reading to basically audio and video material plus with an increase in some online business and some podcasting stuff that I do as well. So yeah, it's it. I do get those folks, and they usually say, "Oh, well, you should listen to books." Now, if they don't listen to books at all, and I'm like, "Oh God, like what are you doing with your life? Like, there's something here." <laughs> so, so when so if somebody says that, you know, I don't, you know, I don't read. That's okay, right? If they if they if they're getting that in some other way you know that you're getting you're getting information from outside now i I, lo- and I also love this idea you said you know dom says i'm an introvert right so dom for those of you who are listening and not watching on youtube what you're not seeing is dom does not look like an introvert today so he is <laughs> <laughs> he's i mean and you can hear he doesn't sound he doesn't sound like an introvert so being an introvert doesn't necessarily mean right that that you can't communicate you can't connect with other people it's it's just that you're going to get your energy from those quiet times right so so you can you can do both so dom is this guy computer degree loves books one of the things that that i hear a lot from my friends and colleagues in the lean continuous improvement community is i really want to write a book I want to write a book, but I don't know how to write a book. Uh, you know, so we have some folks who come from like um, an engineering background. So they know how to write technical papers. And when they sit down and start to write, it looks like a technical paper, right? And then we have other folks who, um, you know, they had to write for school and it wasn't very present, pleasant and they were corrected all the time, right? So that wasn't fun. And for some people, I think they kind of get writer's block. You just can't get words on the page. But you have a message, right, for people who want to get them, who want to get a story out there. So can you tell us about that? How, how do people get, get themselves started? Ah, uh, yes, indeed. So, of course, the cliche easy way of doing it is put on your nikes and just do it that's the easy thing to do just get started but that's Mm. too (laughs) too easy of advice to give the true advice is first find out your why why do you want to write a book do you want to get your message out there do you want to build your business with the book because that can still be done today and i can see that happening for years to come so you can still build your business with a book or you're just trying to leave something for your family when it's time to hit the wonderful box and go a little six feet under so really knowing why you want to write a book me personally i wrote a book because i was challenged to write a book i actually wrote a book on a dare funny enough through a fellow toastmaster and for those who don't know toastmasters is this wonderful 90 plus year organization that helps folks to become better leaders and speakers especially the public speaking aspect of it and when you're in that era that area that climate of success that climate of growth that climate where people want to succeed and want to see others succeed then they're going to push you to a higher level and they're going to want you to get out of your comfort zone. And the thing is, one of the things that helped me to get out of my comfort zone was when I was giving these inspirational talks and you're in Toastmasters for a little bit, you start to notice there are a couple of folks who published books of their own. One guy in particular, he wrote a wonderful book called Burn the Box, Sean Purvis. And his book was all about taking old corporate cliches, especially those ones that rely heavily on sports and flipping them on their head. The classic get out of the box is like, forget the box. There's no box. Let's burn this darn thing. 
So that was the whole premise of the book. And at the end of that book, you mentioned there was going to be a sequel when it was probably about, I think I've read this like five years after he published it. And when I was like, hey, so so Sean, where's the sequel? I was like, oh, I, 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 I didn't uh, get around to it. I'm in a different place now because it was originally going to be called Top Shelf Customer Service. And he was a little bit of a drinker back then when he wrote it. So he figured out oh, oh, I'm a different person now. So, yeah, so that title escaped him. But he saw this as an opportunity to really encourage me to get myself out there because those who speak usually are those who can at least write good or at least well enough to put a book out there. And that's the thing. You don't need an A in English class to write and publish a book. I myself almost failed English class multiple times in high school. <laughs> and I have three books penned to my name now. So you don't need an A and you don't need to be a technical writer unless that's your typical expertise. But first of all, Knowing your why. Why do you want to write a book? Second of all, make an outline, especially if it's like a nonfiction book. And I'm sure that's what a lot of folks are going to be focusing on. If you want to write a novel, you can write an outline for that, too. But the thing is, writing an outline, that getting that outline on paper. So basically, the introduction that has to be the most powerful part of the book itself has got to be a strong chapter. Then go to, I'd say around a good, I'd say seven to ten chapters if you want. Seven topics. And then once you get your outline done and you're focused on it, then focus on filling up that outline with content. So for me in particular, my first ever book going north, I mentioned leadership. I wrote leadership at the top of the page and then wrote all my thoughts down about leadership. Went to time management, wrote all my thoughts about managing my time and being aware of it and my thoughts about it. And then I actually wrote the book because. I was actually writing down my thoughts. I was literally getting my thoughts on the paper. That's the other thing too. Ink it when you think it. So know your why, create an outline, and then ink it when you think it, and then just keep going on from there where you eventually get to the fact where you can actually get to the editing phase, have an editor look at your work, and then if the editor approves it, you make all the appropriate changes, get a book cover done, and then once you get the book cover done, print out a proof. And then when you print out the proof, make sure it's all good and then let it out for the world to devour. And I'd say it's better to try to get it out as quickly as you can within reason and focus on getting it done. Because done is better than perfect. And if you want to get things done, give yourself a deadline. Because a deadline puts a dead end on procrastination. Wow. So you said a lot all that. I actually want to go and dive back into something you said right at the beginning. Actually, two things you said right at the beginning. The first is purpose. And well, that's one of the things that we know in Lean Thinking Continuous Improvement, that purpose is everything, right? If you don't have that purpose, you know, we talk about true north. If you don't have that true north, you know, there's no reason to do anything if you don't know why you're doing it. So I think that's that's critically important for people to understand. And, and I would imagine for some people, it's going to take some work, kind of have this feeling like I want to write a book, but it's going to have to take some work to figure out why you want to write the book. But the second thing you said that I think is really, really critical is getting yourself in a situation like Toastmasters, where you get used to putting yourself out there. Because I know when I was writing, even though I had written professionally, as part of my work had actually been inside a company, being a writer and an editor, even though I had written professionally, writing my own thoughts, getting them on paper, and then sharing them with somebody else was worse than sending a kid to college. I mean, it was so <laughs> painful. The idea of my idea is being out there and what if somebody hated them and and what if what I was thinking was actually stupid and what if this and what if that so what you're saying Dom is that your experience was that being in Toastmasters getting used to standing up giving a talk making a speech getting points across which puts you in that vulnerable position was something that actually prepared you for writing um, and I think that's that's like a that's like a wow wow you know what so if you're listening to this and you're thinking boy you know I I really I want to write whether it's an article I want to write a book that experience too um, whether you do it through Toastmasters or you do it through a lean organization or you do it inside your company that experience has got to help you right and you get used to the idea that you can put something out there and you know what maybe somebody will think it's it's stupid or they won't like it but you you'll survive that 
right? You survive, you survive it. But what did you find when you were in Toastmasters and you started to give talks and when you started to get your writing out there? Did you find that, that, it, that things were well received? I'd say for the most part, a lot of my speeches were well received. One topic in particular, actually, it was even one of the keys in my first book, The Most Efficient Way to Advance Yourself. And I suggested reading three books in a particular subject and then taking action steps based off of those three books in a particular subject. And a lot of folks were like, huh? Because <laughs> I, because back then, studies showed that the average person read at least one book a year to completion. And the thing is, that's increased over time because people are writing smaller books nowadays, and uh -huh. audiobooks can really count as books. So that's the other thing, too. You're not physically reading the book, but you're still absorbing it. And sometimes people really take in information a lot easier through their ears as opposed to their eyes. So there's been times where I've had pushback, and heck, even one thing I want to mention based off of a wonderful author by the name of Tosca Lee, a best-selling author who's written quite a few historical fiction books, is that you need to tap into your writing moxie and write as much as you can with confidence because in the beginning people won't know who you are in the beginning eventually you may get to the point where folks might give you a one star review on amazon and rate you like a blender as she, she <laughs> says but it's a-okay it's a-okay that's just a sign of success because haters will make you greater if you have pushback that's a sign that you're doing something right because somebody wasn't a fan of your ideas and it gives you one or two options either if it's true criticism if it's true constructive criticism that's actually helping you to build yourself up it gives you another way to defend your ideas if you release a second edition of the book and you can expound on that idea or you can just take it with a grain of salt and keep on going with your life because those are one of the two things folks have to keep in mind about haters at the end of the day they make you greater either one ignore them if it's not true advice that makes sense or if they're a quote-unquote hater coming from a place of actual service with some true advice then hey take it for what it is see if it applies and then use that for the following book too because another thing too like even though it's great to write and publish a book in a year my first ever book it's a fabulous book the content's still fabulous it's great but it's not i wouldn't call it a perfect book because there's still some things that were unpolished when it was all said and done but i focused on getting it done and that's the thing about continuous improvement it's always getting better and better. Kind of like the Toyota company. The Toyota Camry, it sold millions, and if not billions, of their Toyota Camry. And they still improve on it every single year. Like every cars single get better year. Yep. Every single year. So see yourself as always, like heck, even with the theme, the edges of lean, always focusing on continuous improvement. If you get your book done and it's published, don't think that's the end because you may come back in a few years and release a five year anniversary, 10 year anniversary, 20 year anniversary version of your book with new thoughts because the book may still have great ideas. But when you grow as a result, you may say, man, I could probably write this even better and I've gotten better and thus it'll be a better project at the end. So don't think it's going to be the be all end all because haters make you greater. And that's another way then to get your to get your name out, talk about what you do, talk about your business, who you are, and say, hey, here's the second edition, here's here's the third edition. I, I love that idea of, of you don't have to be perfect and you know, perfect is the enemy of if you said of done, right? Um, sometimes perfect is also the enemy of, of good. That was certainly something that I found in in writing my book. And and as the, the minute it was out, I was like, oh my gosh. I would love to change this part. I would love to change that part. And, you know, who knows, someday maybe I will. But I, I kind of got to the point where I was spending so much time researching and making sure that I was getting the facts right in there, 100% well, right, because I kind of have a scientific background and I like my facts to be right, that it was, I, I, there, I was in danger of losing my own voice. So can you talk about that too, mm -hmm. about about your own voice and how do you, you know, why is it important to write in your own voice and, and be, be who you are in what you write? Solid question, solid point. You definitely have to be yourself when you write. 
because the thing is, it's like, yes, in your field especially, you definitely want to get the facts right, especially in science, because it's not like a novel or historical fiction where it's like you have leeway to falsify some things and embellish some things for entertainment purposes. Like, hey, this is a real-life situation here. We have to make sure the facts are right. And the thing is, facts will change, too, over time if people make new discoveries. But the other thing is, too, sometimes you may not even have your voice in the beginning because sometimes, especially the way that a lot of us are taught to write in the beginning, it's usually technical, especially if you stay in a technical field. And a lot of things, and heck, even one thing I've heard advice before from Dr. Dennis Kimbrough is to, when you write a book, write as if you're writing a letter to the to a friend. And the thing is, if you're writing as a letter to a friend, they'll be more receptive to it. And also keep writing too, because the thing is, your writing will get better in time. As with just about anything, the more you do something, the better you become at it, especially if you take evaluated experience into play, where you look at your past experience, you evaluate it, and then the continuous improvement that Kaiser comes back into play, it's like, okay, I could have improved this here, I could have said this better. And the thing is, also keep in mind that the writing phase and the editing phase have to be totally separate, especially from mm -hmm. a creative aspect, because that's something that even still sticks me me now being an author especially for my philosophy classes because my professor said when you're writing papers in this class write as much as you can get it on paper then work on the editing piece because a creative mind is definitely a lot different from a mind just trying to get things correct it's like a leader versus a manager a manager's trying to get things right down to a science down to things that the way are supposed to be done in the system a leader is focusing on his or her influence especially her influence making sure it's a positive influence helping folks to grow and get better and may not care as much as if everything's right if it's 97 percent correct then keep going as opposed to the manager may be like okay it has to be done the strict exact way so try to keep the strictness of trying to do editing while you're writing because that'll ruin your flow because you can always go back when you're editing and then research later making sure that what you put down is correct as well so try to keep the writing and the creative phase separate from the editing phase that is really important and that's something that i teach when i'm teaching creativity and how to use creativity with with lean thinking with continuous improvement I mean, the brain actually, you know, we can only ever do one thing at a time with our brain. We think we can do more than one thing at a time, but the brain can only do really one thing at a time. And it can either be creative and, you know, have ideas and connect ideas, or it can make judgments. And you can't do the two things at the same time. So even though we think we can multitask that, we can't. And that's another enemy of getting done, right, is 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 stopping and like rereading and going, oh, my gosh, look what I wrote. And rather than just, you know, get it out there, go back and edit it later. You know, that's a, um, th you know, that was a, that was also something, you know, that um, that I found as, as I was writing my book was was I really just had to sit down and write. And then I was very fortunate that I had a partner that I that I was working with um, that I would send my stuff to and then I forget about it while he read it. And then we discuss it later. And that, that really helped me. We just um, because, first of all, it got me over the somebody else is going to read this and they might hate it. And this person was a friend. So even if they hated it, they were going to hate it in a friendly way. Um, and secondly, um, that separation of time between when I wrote it and when we were going to talk about it and how I was going to improve it actually helped um, me keep them separate, keep creativity and judgment separate from each other. So when, when, you, when you're writing, Dom, do you write with a partner? Do you have people that you share your writing with before you send it out? Uh, I probably should in terms of like beta yeah. readers for like a finished product from a book, but not really. I kind of stay in a silo because it's the other thing too, is that you have to really be selective of who you share your mm -hmm. writing and your goals and your dreams and your aspirations with. Because there's some folks who may kill your dreams before you even get your plane off of a darn ramp. And when you're trying to get your metaphorical dream, your book, into flight mode you got to make sure folks are helping you to be the wind underneath your wings and helping you to stay afloat as you get to that destination of finished so i'd say no for the writing piece no i really don't focus too much on that uh -huh. I, I may ask for like of course in the editing phase you, you have to ask for somebody for that but yeah, yeah usually it it probably will be better depending on what you're doing but me personally no <laughs> 
No, I, and and that, and that's fine. But I think it's I think it's another really great point there. You know, I just kind of pull out what you said, and that is if you are going to share it, you want to share it with somebody who is supportive and is going to feel co-creative with you, co-creative with you, not somebody who wants to drag you down. Um, and it may not be that they, you know, that they're going to be someone who's like, oh gosh, I got to drag Dom down but it might just be that that's their attitude right they've been trained in being critical they've been trained in finding the flaws in something before they look at what's good in something so many people are trained that way um you know in various fields and and so find if you're gonna find somebody as i did find somebody who's gonna who's gonna say hey you know what i like about this and see what they like about it before they offer any suggestions for um, improvement. And of course, there are always suggestions, right? If you're the owner, it's your voice. You don't have to take the suggestions. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you, you've got your purpose. You're getting used to kind of getting your voice out there. You make your outline. You fill in your outline. You get it done. Dom, how did you find your editor? Ah, uh, yeah, funny enough. My first book was actually a friend who actually got a bachelor's in screenplay writing from Oregon State University. Actually, had a trusted friend do it. And then oh, with my cool. second book, actually, yeah. And, and it was cost effective, too. And he was a trusted yeah. friend. And the other thing, too, is about him, he was honest, too. That's the thing. He was honest. He wasn't afraid to give his honest feedback, too. Because it's like, yeah, there's the dream kills, but also you have to know who you're talking to that's really going to give you the straight truth too you have to have those who are willing to give you the truth that you need to hear because it's like yeah they it, it may somewhat hurt at first but at the same time it's like I'm making sure their intention is in the right place and his intention was in the right place and it helped my first book to be better than what it was going to be and my editor for book number Two, that one I actually met through Toastmasters, and I've recommended her to uh -huh. quite a few other folks, and she's enjoyed, and the folks I recommended her to, they've, they've enjoyed her. Kathy Oshamo mentioned her name because she's freaking fabulous. Fellow Christian, our core values align for the most part. She's also had some time in the U.S. service as well, in the military, and she also has a military spouse too, I believe, and she is this awesome, wonderful lady. So, yeah, that's really kind of how I really found editors for it and of course if you want you can always go through fiverr as well and look at past projects and past reviews because the thing about fiverr is the fact that those usually give you those comments check out the comments and if they're mostly positive then you can also do a second edit as well so that way before you get to your true blue editor you can always have another editor look at things because there's sometimes there may be certain ideas that they may not finish funny enough there's like multiple edits that need to be done to like a big book project there's always the proofreading then there's the actual editing for content like a content editor and then there's a copy editor which i didn't even think about where they have to make sure everything is lined up properly in the final project too so that's the other thing you have to keep in mind it's not going to be oh yeah it's it's the editor one and done <laughs> this right, is going to be great the, like <laughs> it's yeah, a, a lot of cycles a lot, yeah, a lot of cycles i know which is I mean, what we know we expect and continuous improvement. You're going to go through those cycles. But content editing is different from copy editing, right? It's different from proofreading. And so those are those are all different, you know, different things. One of the things that I found really helpful for uh, for folks who use Word was the was where um, the function where it will read what you have written back to you. And I found that really, really Input helpful to have it read it back to me because that was when I found a lot of you know sentences that <laughs> that you know they look great on paper but when they read out loud they weren't all that great and I thought well that's a really cool thing and of course you know in Word and some other software you've got you've got your spell checker and grammar checker um, you know all of that is helpful too but all of that, all of that other help in terms of getting from what's in your mind, the brilliant idea in your mind to getting it on a page out there somewhere is, uh, you know, those are all important steps. And okay, so you, you've done all that. So how do you publish it, Dom? How do you oh, yeah. get it out there? 
Yeah, so there's multiple options. So if you have like a literary agent, I didn't go this route, just a disclaimer, but if you have a literary agent and they ship it off to different publishers and one picks it up, then fabulous. That's freaking awesome. Then you get to go through the traditional route. I myself, I personally went through the self-publishing route with my two solo books. And then there's uh -huh. a third multi-author project called From Crappy to Happy, where <laughs> they have their own system in place. So with my first two books, I self-published through... Well, actually, there's multiple ways. It basically Amazon for uh -huh. both books. My my first book was in 2016 with Create Space when it was still Create Space. Then my second book, that was a second solo book, Stay the Course. That was actually done through two publishers, both KDP Amazon and Ingram Spark. Because the thing is, like, you can publish on KDP, which is great. But the other thing is, like, if you publish through Ingram Spark, then you have more opportunities to get into universities and libraries and other places like that so you can also do more than one as well so that's what i did there and with that you have to make sure after everything is all edited copy edited and all that other good stuff have a book cover done i went through fiverr for my book cover and it only cost me like 120 bucks i believe because uh -huh. they did the interior formatting along with the cover because I didn't do that with my first book, and I hated every moment of it. <laughs> that was tough. Of the, of the, of the interior formatting? The, yeah, that's really yeah. hard. That's hard work. Yeah. 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 Now, where you think yeah. you got something lined up, boom, it it popped off the page, or you, you you lost something. Yeah. Better have somebody else do that. Somebody who does it for, does it mm -hmm. does it all the time. Yeah. So, so, so there are a lot of different pathways to do that. Um, and then you get it out there. And as you said, you know, certainly you want to think about how do I refresh it? How do I update it? But talk about what you've done with your book and your box and your podcast and how you kind of link that. Um, and what, what are you what are you doing there? Uh, so the true work begins there. So when your book is done and you get that cop in your hand, you see your name in the bottom of the cover of the page and you feel like Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 12, the boyhood dream has finally been realized. You won the World Heavyweight Championship Whoa. and you stare at the book for a good 40 straight minutes like you're possessed or something. It's like, oh my gosh, uh -huh. it's freaking real. And then you have to really go out there and market and sell your book. That's the real test. That's when the real work begins because I've done book signings, especially in the BC before COVID era. I uh, did one in my church, sold 100 books, then went to another city a few miles outside my hometown, <laughs> drew a couple folks there, then did a couple of the signings at libraries as well, did some joint book signings with other folks, especially since one guy in particular, we did a joint book signing because we published our books at a similar time. He, I think his was probably... I think his was like maybe a couple weeks before mine, and we did a book swap. And if you read through both books, you realize that really a lot of the topics we were talking about they were similar. So it was like, oh yeah, let's co let's collaborate. And this other thing too, I had to collaborate as well. You have to really get creative as like a marketer because you're basically in you're basically a business owner at that point. You have your own book business with your book out there. So doing book signings, book events, selling books, getting on podcasts, podcasts like this, no matter how big or small, because sometimes you, no matter how big or small the audience is, you may catch that one person who may be the VP of a certain company that brings you in. Heck, I remember one time at a book event, a book swap, where I bought a table at the Baltimore Book Festival. It was a Friday which is a bad idea from the beginning <laughs> because ah, everybody was at work. <laughs> yeah, yeah every, everybody was at work and there was really no foot traffic. I only sold four books and I paid a good hundred bucks for the darn vending table. And funny enough, one lady who I met, a fellow author, when I was networking with folks, we did a book swap. And lo and behold, a few months later, after the book event, even though I thought I lost money, I was invited to speak for her Martin Luther King Day breakfast for her youth program called Positive Youth Expressions in Baltimore City. And that was all because I did that book swap and I got an honorarium that paid for the table and went to my pocket later. So the other thing too, and that's probably the big jewel I want to give to folks, is that it's focused on the long game. This is continuous improvement. It's not going to be, oh, it's going to be, I'm going to be on Oprah. Oprah's going to come out of retirement <laughs> for this technical book. She's going to put on some specs in the lab coat just for me. And I'm going to be all on billboards and whatnot. It's like, no, nope, no, nope, it's a long game. Focus on the long game. Focus on 
getting better, collaborate with other people, because this is the age of collaboration, because we are better together. We're not butter together. Uh, better together, not better together. Yeah. Yeah. And collaboration and co creativity. I mean, I think that, yeah, I think you're right. That is, that is what this age is about. I think, you know, the age of, 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 of it's all about what competing with each other. Because, because, and it was so interesting about your book and this other author's book being complementary to each other. Because I know in my own experience, you know, I've read one book and then I've read another book. I've read the two books simultaneously because I do that. It's like, wow, these two books really go together. And if you don't mind my sharing, I had that experience with a wonderful book which got me into lean product development, which is called Michael Kennedy's Product Development for the Lean, the lean Corporation. Right. Um, which I think Michael at this point would like to rewrite, but it was it's, it was a wonderful book at, in its time. And I read that at the same time that I read The Rule of St. Benedict, which was where St. Benedict's talking, explaining all the rules for his monastery and how people needed were going to live together in community in a monastery. Now, you would think those two books have nothing to do with each other. But in fact, there were so many complementary ideas about community and how to work together and and especially how to listen to people in an organization. Because Benedict starts out his, his book, I think the first words are, are listen. And it's about listening. He talks about how the abbot, the head of the monastery, needs to listen to all of his monks, especially the youngest ones, the newest ones, which is exactly in lean thinking what we say the leader needs to do. You need to be down there you know, with the folks who are actually, you know, the new people, the people who are on the line making the thing that you sell, because those are the people who have, you know, have the, the wisdom to share with you. That was so complimentary, you know. So I love this idea of collaboration, not competition. Better together, not better together. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Tell us about your podcast. Sure thing. It's actually one of the ways I market myself, my business, and my books, the Going North Podcast, Tips and Techniques to Advance Yourself, because that was also the name of my first ever book that became a podcast, and it's all about interviewing different authors. Every Monday, Thursday, and Saturday, a new episode goes live with a different author, and the bet of the show is self-help and continuous improvement, because that's really what I'm all about, and just inspiring others to realize that success is tangible. And there's a nice diverse cast of authors on there. So if you, so if you have a hobby where you like reading romance books, I've actually interviewed a couple of romance authors, which I never thought I would ever do in my lifetime. Wow! <laughs> All the way to New York Times bestselling authors and folks with TEDx talks and TED talks and things like that. And right now, I'm about a good. The official 400th episode went live on September. Six, and I'm on my way Congrats. to interviewing over a thousand authors across the globe. So that's the goal with the show, indeed. And Bella's going to be on the show too. She has a nice return to favor. So that way she can promote her book and her business and all the stuff that she's doing. Because it's again collaboration. We're better together. We don't want to be butter. Well, thanks, Dom. I'm, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. But it's also something if you are sitting out there thinking of writing your book. Keep Dom in your list of contacts. Connect with him on LinkedIn because who knows one day you might be a guest on his show. You could certainly be a guest on the Edges of Lean and you, you definitely uh, should be able to reach out to Dom too and, and uh, see if there's a spot for you out there as well. So, um, yeah, so you've taken this all the way from purpose through getting it out there to, to marketing it. Um, when you've got it done, and as you said, it's never done, so it's continuous improvement. When you've got it done, what do you think it does for a person to be able to say, I published a book? I wrote a book, I got it published. Ah, one of the things I'd like to say is that when you conquer fear at one level, you get to conquer fear at another level. Especially if you're one of those introverted folks who doesn't like to put themselves out there and you mm. like to keep your energy high by being alone. Well, the thing is, you have to really. Put yourself out there and realize, man, I conquered this fear. Like, um, I got, I'm in the business of immortality now. My name is on this book right now. And it's like, I got something that's going to live long after I'm gone here. And really just use that as fuel for your next win. Because the thing is, that's only the beginning. The real journey begins once it's published because you got to put yourself mm. out there. And as you get better in advance and keep getting better and not butter, you basically are going to be probably writing even more books because my first book, I did say I was going to publish a book two years after that. And 
even though it was delayed, it still happened. So you may even want to publish another book after that. You may want to keep just writing more. So what that'll do for you is that you'll also even have a business card as well, a calling card. So that way, you'll have something that can go with your thoughts, with your ideas, with your stories, with the experience that not only lives long after you're gone, but it can go to places where you can't go. Your information, your ideas can go to places when you're asleep. You could be making money while you sleep. If enough people catch the fire that you have through your writings and you will have a way to get yourself out there to get your story heard and to really set yourself apart from the competition out there. So write that book today, get it out there and then keep going past that. And don't let that be the finish. Just keep going past that because if you advance others, you'll definitely advance yourself. Thank you. So, Dom, what is your advice? Thinking about the folks like you, maybe a 16-year-old kid setting their job in the library or, uh, you know, somebody stepping out of, the, of high school, college, uh, technical school, studying their first, their first uh, step in their career. What's Dom Brightman's advice to that young person? Oh, uh, yes. Listen to the Going North podcast, especially the 30 for 30 episode where I share 30 lessons learned from being 30 years on the planet. That's the semi-serious yeah. advice, but also some right now advice that you could take home with you. Realize that success is never in a straight line. Once you get out of college, high school, things are going to be going in a direction where you will not expect it. It's happened to me in my life, and I'm at a point now where I never thought I would be in a good way. And realize that success is never going to be in a straight line. Also, learn some financial literacy as well, because they didn't teach you that in high school, and I'm pretty darn mm-hmm. sure they didn't teach that in college either. It's like <laughs> every there's pro- everyone there's probably broke on whatever. So, making sure you pick up financial literacy, learn some public speaking as well. Take a couple of public speaking classes, join Toastmasters, get yourself out there, because if you can add public speaking to your skill set. That will be something else to put you at an advantage because public speaking has given me such an advantage and it's one of my wheelhouses. So realize that success is not a straight line. Pick up some financial literacy, some financial acumen so that way you can be able to better manage your finances so you won't be hating life as you age and be better to better fit to get into the journey of adulting, which a lot of adults aren't a fan of. And then also pick up a public speaking course and learn how to give a solid good presentation because you never know you might be called to give a toast at a wedding or something and if you have that skill under your belt you'll be ready because you've done it before and you can use your mind for the two magical things pre-play and replay where you get to pre-play those past victories and then you get to replay the future victories that you have made in the present that's awesome thank you Don Brightman it's been such a pleasure having you journey with us to the edges of lean with Bella Engelbach and I'd like to thank Don Brightman for being my guest on the Edges of Lean. When is your book coming out? We love to hear from you. Find Dom at DomBrightman.com at the Going North Podcast or on LinkedIn. Find me at LeanForHumans.com or on LinkedIn. Or comment wherever you watch or listen. No matter how you travel to the Edges of Lean, your ratings, reviews and comments are greatly appreciated. Please join me in exploring more of the edges of lean. There's a lot to learn. And check out my friends in the Lean Communicators community at leancommunicators.com. You'll find more podcasts and videos with lots of great new content every week. The Edges of Lean is written and produced by Bella Engelberg with support from Sarah Masili of Podcast Inc. This is a Lean for Humans production.